This is the first in a series of video clips by Kate King and Sarah Cox on practical strategies for parents in supporting children with dyslexia. This first clip looks at dyslexia, the definitions, diagnosis and where dyslexia sits in the term neurodiversity. Dyslexia can present in many different ways and what we see is a bit like the bit of the iceberg that we see above the water. Dyslexia is commonly associated with difficulties with spelling, difficulty remembering and hearing the sounds, linking the sound to the letters and remembering what words look like. These difficulties affect reading, making it hard to decode a word, to instantly recognise a word and using so much effort that the process is slow and meaning is lost. Writing is often where we see a mismatch between the verbal and the written, with a difficulty in getting knowledge and ideas on paper, a fear of getting spellings wrong and finding the right word, and a lack of punctuation. But there are other things that we will observe too. Times tables and telling the time are hard to learn and retain. Organisation and sequencing can be a struggle. Left and right are confused and short-term memory weaknesses mean that what you've just said is forgotten in an instant. Some difficulties do not become apparent until the load is increased. So it's always important to look at what a child is avoiding doing because after all, we all shy away from what we find hard. We know when something is wrong and we want to help, but knowing how to help is a challenge as what we can do can lead to more frustration for both the adult and the child. Getting the right help at the right time is important but in order to give the right help, we need to understand the difficulties and what lies behind what we see. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders provides definitions of different labels, different diagnoses. This is what it says about dyslexia. That it's a specific learning disorder that impedes the ability to learn or use academic skills, such as reading, writing or arithmetic. And difficulties must have been persistent in the school years. There is something known as acquired dyslexia, which can appear later in life, which is why there is reference to presentation of difficulties in school years. This is really quite a broad definition and it doesn't tell us much, which is why I prefer to use the British Dyslexia Association's definition. So here's the BDA's definition. That dyslexia is a specific learning difficulty which mainly affects the development of literacy and language related skills likely to be present at birth and be lifelong in its effects. It's characterised by difficulties with phonological processing, rapid naming, working memory, processing speed and automatic development of skills that may not match up to an individual's other cognitive abilities. Phonological processing is the linking of sounds and letters, the coding and decoding, spelling and reading. Rapid naming is recalling letters or digits. Working memory is what we can hold in our head while we're using it. Why did I come upstairs? And processing speed is how long a process takes thinking. The final paragraph is important because it states that it, dyslexia tends to be resistant to conventional teaching methods. So it persists despite good teaching and its effects can be mitigated by appropriate specific intervention, so specialist teaching or tutoring, and that includes the application of IT, of information technology, and supportive counselling. I think the last bit about supportive counselling is really important because that recognises that there can be emotional and mental health issues associated with dyslexic difficulties. Using the metaphor of the iceberg again, we can see the difficulties or weaknesses that are below the waterline, the things that are behind what we see above the waterline. We need to understand where a process such as reading or spelling is breaking down, so we can put in the right support. What is needed it will vary as the skills develop and the demands of the curriculum. Sometimes we need a combination of quick fixes or sticking plasters while core skills are being worked on. This could be reading to a child so that their weakness is not a barrier to the learning, or scribing so they can show their knowledge and ideas because the process of writing is taking too much effort. When and how to get a diagnosis is a question I'm often asked. It's generally felt that a diagnosis below the age of eight is not secure because underlying skills may be needing more time to develop. 
It's always worth providing targeted intervention as a first step so that we can establish if the difficulty we're observing is a skill that's slow to acquire or an underlying difficulty. One-to-one -one intervention is key here alongside sound strategies in class and TO support. We need to know what's working and also what's not working. Both the educational psychologist and the specialist teacher can diagnose dyslexia and what they do is similar. The key difference is the tools they use. The educational psychologist typically has access to the latest version of a Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children, the WISC-5, which looks at different aspects of cognitive functioning in great detail and in a very pure way. For example, the verbal comprehension elements are purely verbal, unlike the CAT scores. Specialist assessors use a different tool, which is older and not as detailed. Both look at the different skills involved and it's this combination of innate abilities and processing skills compared with a detailed breakdown of the skills that use the reading and spelling, etc., that give us the information that we need to inform teaching, support and intervention. But things are not always simple. Dyslexia rarely stands alone. All of the labels that we use are overlap with common difficulties observed, but the diagnosis is made using the assessment carried out. So what you can say is that the door you knock on is the label you get and too often they stand alone. So here with this diagram we can see the crossover between dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, specific language impairment, sensory difficulties with poor concentration and distractibility at the centre because after all concentrating is going to be hard when we find something difficult. This diagram by Professor Amanda Kirby shows how the term neurodiversity sits at the centre of different diagnoses and how interlinked they all are. Around the outside we have the different labels and at the centre sit strengths and weaknesses that apply to individuals irrespective of labels. You only get the label if you meet the diagnostic criteria but that doesn't mean to say that you don't have difficulties. You can see the dotted lines that go between the different labels linking difficulties between labels and how much crossover there is. In my opinion, it's more important to look beyond the labels at the difficulties the individual's experiencing, because after all, neurodiversity is unique human wiring. The traits that are central are positive ones, and those are very important. They're traits such as empathy, creativity, persistence, analytical skills, energy, the ability to problem solve, but they can go hand in hand with others that are more problematic, such as fatigue, anxiety and camouflaging difficulties. Experts now say that it's more about how the brain is wired. Visual functioning is how the eyes see and move. To my knowledge, there's no research-based evidence that difficulties with visual functioning is part of dyslexia. But if you ask any specialist dyslexia teacher, they often find that a difficulty with visual functioning impacts on the acquisition of reading and spelling skills, whether there's dyslexia or no dyslexia diagnosed. If we can't sustain focus on text, or we can't clearly hear the sounds, both of those are going to impact on learning, making it much harder. And when something's hard, we disengage and avoid it, so we fall behind. There's a very useful checklist on visual functioning on the Bebo website. Early screening for hearing and visual function, not just acuity but also how the eyes move, is important because therapy or intervention can be key in preventing a child from falling behind. The school screening programme can do this in school screening use, using the help of an optometrist and an audiologist advising on further referral if difficulties are identified. Even if there's no functional difficulty, we get tired when anything is hard work, whether it's running or reading. Sometimes there are simple adaptations that can help a child, but it's a personal thing and not one size fits all. It may be cream paper, more rounded fonts, larger print or bigger spaces between the line. So you need to try out what works for that child. Visual functioning is different from visual processing. Visual processing is how the brain interprets visual information. 
but sadly we don't have time to go into that today. If you want more information on that, please look at the British Dyslexia Association's website. It's important not to disregard the many strengths that come with a differently wired dyslexic brain. When we're supporting any learning difference, we must look for strengths and use them to build skills and self-esteem. Here are just some of the commonly found strengths in people with dyslexia. They can think outside the box, thinking outside predictable or routine ways. They can think holistically, looking at the whole rather than just the parts. They're lateral thinkers, able to see past the detail and process information in different ways. Verbally strong, they can talk around issues, expressing themselves better verbally than through their writing. They often are incredibly creative. If you only have to Google famous dyslexics to find people like Picasso, Walt Disney, Cher, Jamie Oliver, and so the list goes on. They often have technical and construction skills because they're able to see in 3D. Think of people like Leonardo da Vinci. They're intuitive, able to make associations, linking ideas, solving problems. They can multitask, running ideas at the same time, like a video in their mind. And they're often sporty, using their visual spatial skills, combined with the determination and resilience that they've built over many years of finding learning difficult. If we look at a child through the lens of a label, it can be like looking through a keyhole. Before we jump to grasp a label, my experience has taught me that we should look at the whole child, which is why I use a research-based learner profiling tool to look at memory and vision, auditory processing, emotions and feelings, speaking, listening and understanding, attention, organisation and time management, literacy and numeracy of course, but also sensory processing and physical coordination. When we take the time to observe the whole child, we can see not just the difficulties but also the strengths. Different difficulties may need different clinicians and intervention and therapy. Whatever the difficulty, dyslexia or just dyslexic traits, behaviour is communication that's based on a feeling that's rooted in a need. We need to provide scaffolding to help them and build their toolbox of skills to take them into adulthood. Thank you for listening.